The Chinese Cultural Revolution is one of the most important and understudied events in the history of communism. It's up there with the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Bolshevik October takeover. This is mainly for two reasons. For starters, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution represented a failed attempt at overcoming the problems with the Leninist Party form and the state socialist model implemented by most Soviet-aligned countries. China during the Cultural Revolution represented something radically different from this model. Second, and most importantly, I believe that the Cultural Revolution contains some of the most sobering lessons for people on the left. In fact, many of the lessons of the Cultural Revolution are directly relevant to some of the issues that we still face today, which are hot topics in contemporary discourse. While some of you may have been able to already infer a verdict of your own based on what you saw in the last video, I don't think the lessons of the Cultural Revolution are exactly obvious. Far from it. This was the question that I left my readers with in the essay that I wrote on the Cultural Revolution titled Totalitarianism or Anarchy, published in the book titled Underground Theory. In this video, which essentially serves as a much shorter sequel to my previous mini-documentary on the Cultural Revolution, I will reveal my personal opinions and interpretation that I have come to regarding the events of the Cultural Revolution, which I was not able to fully articulate in that essay. As a result, this sequel video won't exactly be as mass appeal compared to my others, but I believe it will be among the most unique and useful for those who take emancipatory politics seriously and want to play a role in changing the world for the better. This is part two, the final part, of the One Dime series on the Cultural Revolution. Lessons of the Cultural Revolution's Failure The real failure of the Cultural Revolution was not just that it created chaos, as some degree of instability would have been inevitable when undergoing such a radical socialist transformation. Rather, its real failure was that it did not fulfill its original aim of producing democratic political institutions that might have permitted the masses to maintain control over the means of production and eventually bring about their own emancipation and the emancipation of society as a whole. While such a colossal task is undoubtedly difficult and would have taken a long time, the end product of the Cultural Revolution ended up being the explosion of capitalist relations. The aftermath of the Cultural Revolution created a widespread political exhaustion that made it easier for the party cadres who superseded Mao to re-centralize state power and take the capitalist road. Precisely what Mao wanted to prevent. Literally Mao's worst nightmare. But the failure of the Cultural Revolution can't merely be blamed on Mao's decision to side with the party state in turning against the independent organizations and calling the military to stop their revolts. The Red Guard movement's descent into violent factional power struggles created a calamity that allowed the PLA, with Mao's consent, to frame themselves as the agents of order against the agents of disorder. But the question still remains. What led to the implosion of the independent organizations? The Cultural Revolution and the independent organizations that initially blossomed during the first two years of the Cultural Revolution imploded from the inside due to unresolved contradictions that still plague many political movements to this day. Creation vs. Negation The Politics of Dismissal and Pluralization As brilliantly articulated by the theorist Alessandro Russo in his book Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture, the implosion of the Cultural Revolution was by and large the result of a tension that was there from the very beginning. A contradiction between two different registers of politics, dismissal and pluralization, in which dismissal ended up winning out. Dismissal is what one could call a statist or an authoritarian logic that involves the desire to occupy positions of power that allow one to rule other people. The psychology of dismissal involves the enjoyment in deciding the fate of others. Dismissal is sort of like that cop in your head. This is the behavioral dynamic at play in almost every case of power struggles within the state. While dismissal is a rule of thumb in political affairs, there are also egalitarian exceptions, where those who are usually in the position of being governed begin to self-organize and create egalitarian relations for themselves, separate from existing state hierarchies and practices. The term Rousseau uses to describe this process is pluralization. The sequence of pluralization during the Cultural Revolution occurred mainly between the first two years, when the revolution saw the construction of various novel forms of egalitarian projects that we discussed earlier. However, the Cultural Revolution showed us that dismissal and the enjoyment of dominating others carries over outside of the state. For Rousseau, the triumph of dismissal over pluralization played an integral role in the Cultural Revolution's demise into factionalism. 
in which arbitrary splits and power struggles led to the implosion of these egalitarian organizations. The word implosion is key. These organizations self-destructed without the state needing to break them up. Authoritarianism without authorities Now, one would think that the spontaneous creation of egalitarian organizations that were independent from the state would lead to a more anti-authoritarian movement. Authoritarianism is a phenomenon typically associated with the state. However, during the Cultural Revolution, as the galvanized masses were handed power to rebel, many people acted exactly like states themselves, engaging in similar dominating behaviors and getting enjoyment out of it. This pleasure in controlling the lives of others is seen in the endless examples of how people policed each other during the Cultural Revolution, in a process that resembled medieval witch hunting. The key takeaway from all of this is that the logic of dismissal, the enjoyment in deciding the fate of others, is not a mentality exclusive to those who pursue politics as a career in the state. The practice of dismissal is a typical feature of politics as usual within the government, but the fact that the practice of dismissal was weaponized by the masses themselves against each other outside of the state is emblematic of an overlooked dilemma that many people, especially on the left, overlook being that policing can still occur without official police, that authoritarianism can still occur without state authorities. The mentality of dismissal was a major factor as to why the Cultural Revolution devolved into a self-destructive politics of pure negation, rather than creation, seen by the preoccupation with the destruction of old elements, supposed class enemies, and the moral policing of each other, which ended up overpowering the experimentation with new political forms separate from state structures. And the logic of dismissal re-emerged in the form of a factional struggle whereby the priorities of independent organizations were reduced to different Redguard factions trying to seize power and eliminate their rival factions. Instead of maintaining independence from the party state, groups fought each other over political or military supremacy, often in the form of dominance over different areas of the country. Alessandro Russo brilliantly illustrates the problem with dismissal, the politics of negation, and how it can hinder the politics of creation. What I have called the dismissal process did not involve any real political experimentation. It was intrinsically in line with the seizure of power, whose synonym ultimately was dismissal. One takes power when one dismisses another from power. Dismissal is what governmental subjects of all times and countries have always practiced. The fact that in the case of socialism, it was argued in the name of communist and egalitarian revolutionary principles only served to make its function more ambiguous. However, dismissal is not at all transitive to egalitarian experimentation, as the Cultural Revolution dramatically demonstrated. When the processes of egalitarian mass invention established their objectives around the seizure of power, meaning the dismissal of certain powers and their replacement by others, those inventions annihilated themselves. Indeed, they served as a lever for a change of hands between powerful entities that did not know what to do with egalitarian political experimentation. The unresolved problem that the Cultural Revolution left behind was, first of all, how to find and maintain the necessary political distance between the two processes. One can interpret this tension between dismissal and the politics of creation in different ways. For Alessandro Russo, the fact that so many rebels ended up adopting the practice of dismissal, what was normally a status logic, was directly linked to the party state's interference in the movement and its overbearing role in Chinese society as a whole. Rousseau argues that the party state's attempts to manage the conditions of the Cultural Revolution and contain it prompted the rebel organizations to start orienting their objectives around the seizure of power rather than focusing on productive experiments outside of the state. Recall that the Cultural Revolution originally began with purges from above, first seen in the Hyrule Affair. One could argue, as Rousseau does, that the masses of rebels later emulated this logic of dismissal against each other. Mao tried to promote both pluralization and dismissal at once. On the one hand, Mao encouraged the blossoming of independent egalitarian organizations. But as these rebel organizations became more fractured and anarchic, Mao and the CCRG urged the different rebel organizations who had begun to splinter to instead unify and overthrow the revisionist forces amongst the state bureaucracy. But this backfired. Because Mao and the CCRG ended up framing the Cultural Revolution as a seizure of power from revisionist authorities, this implanted a certain logic into the different Red Guard groups that primed them to turn on each other and seize power from one another. 
The key lesson here is that the primary mission of a socialist revolution should be based on what it wants to build rather than just what it wants to destroy. This begs the question, if we are to subscribe to Alessandro Russo's interpretation which is more sympathetic to the Red Guards and places more blame on the state, could the Cultural Revolution have gone in a better direction if it had not begun with the purges of state officials from above and if the masses had been given power to act autonomously from the state much earlier? Personally, I'm not so convinced. Did the rebels of the Cultural Revolution adopt the practices of dismissal against each other and shift their goals towards the seizure of power simply because of Mao Zedong and the practices of the state? Or is dismissal indicative of a much deeper problem? Is dismissal really a status mentality or a human mentality? Is the self-destructive behavior of dismissal just part of human nature? Or is it more just deeply conditioned into human behavior due to humans living under state authorities for centuries? Consider that China is one of the oldest civilizations with much of its population living under authoritarian states for centuries. One could easily interpret all of these events of the Cultural Revolution as a lesson as to why human nature makes emancipatory politics impossible. However, one can also argue that as products of our socioeconomic conditions, humans emulate the logics and habits that they inherit from their society and its overlords. These are quite important questions that I encourage you to interrogate, because they force us to confront the critical dilemmas that a revolutionary politics will likely face, which we have to actively choose to deal with rather than solely blaming the failures of revolutionary movements on external causes such as imperialism, foreign coups, revisionist traitors, or corrupt totalitarian leaders who abuse their power. I don't claim to have the definitive answers to these questions, and I encourage you to comment your thoughts as to which interpretation you're more convinced by, but I have a few tentative hypotheses of my own, which we will briefly speculate on here. Resentiment, Dismissal, and Cancel Culture as part of his theory of slave morality and ressentiment, Friedrich Nietzsche argued that those who are the most impotent have the greatest thirst for power. But most people repress their will to power and cope with their impotence by adopting a form of religious ideology that they use as a veil to turn their powerlessness into a virtue and morally denounce those who do have power. The pleasure of power derives from the displeasure experienced a hundred times of dependency, of impotence. If this experience is lacking, then that pleasure is absent as well. Given how the Cultural Revolution panned out, perhaps Nietzsche was onto something when he predicted that those who have the least power can sometimes be the most dangerous and destructive when getting a taste of it. You could see this logic of ressentiment at play when it came to the obsession with weaponizing the label of bourgeois as a moral category and the glorification of so-called proletarian culture, which popularized the terrible stereotype of communism being a poverty cult. After tirelessly going after party bureaucrats and running out of imagined class enemies to persecute, the Red Guards soon turned on each other in a bitter power struggle. The phenomenon that we call dismissal, the enjoyment in determining the fate of others, is at the heart of what we call cancel culture. The Cultural Revolution shows that the phenomenon at play in what we today call cancel culture is not a strictly online phenomenon or something new. Cancel culture is a term that is often abused and people tend to use it to describe very different things. I personally don't think cases of famous people just facing criticism for provocative things that they said is really cancel culture. No, JK Rowling and Dave Chappelle aren't really cancelled. I think the main problem that's actually important in the phenomenon that we describe as cancel culture pertains to the moral policing of sociopolitical spaces and so-called communities in which people in the in-group are dogpiled and dismissed from it due to not adhering to a certain moral purity of that in-group. This is why I prefer the term dismissal instead of cancel culture when referring to this problem of in-group policing, because it is not necessarily a new thing. And it's a real self-destructive tendency that must be dealt with if any political movement wants to thrive without imploding. This practice of dismissal, which typically involves a pseudo-politics of identity and the adherence to certain moral expectations, can repress underlying differences that people are too scared to express, and can lead to the cannibalization of movements due to an unreasonable expectation of moral purity. If you want to see more as to how this phenomenon of dismissal in the Cultural Revolution relates to cancel culture, I highly recommend this excellent article by Assad Haider. The practice of dismissal must be contained or balanced by a politics of pluralization and creation that goes beyond the mere negation of things and is more tolerant to human differences and mistakes. 
Many people take a long time to adjust to change, and we can never all agree on everything. Class and the Dictatorship of the Proletariat Last but not least, the final lesson of the Cultural Revolution concerns the question of class as a political category, and the viability of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat is a key idea in Marxist theory that most Marxists subscribe to in some way, shape, or form. The basic idea with the dictatorship of the proletariat is that the socialist transition between capitalism and communism must be spearheaded by a state ruled by the previously exploited classes, namely the working class, in a coalition with the peasantry, who constitute the majority of the population that never had much of a say in bourgeois democracy. However, the experience of the Cultural Revolution revealed some additional issues with the dictatorship of the proletariat. In his book Mao's China and After, A History of the People's Republic, the historian Maurice Meisner eloquently sums up one of the most overlooked issues of class in revolutionary China. One of the ironies of China's post-revolutionary history, fully apparent during the Cultural Revolution, is that the revolutionaries drawn from the oppressed classes under the old regime tended to be socially and politically conservative under the new regime, increasingly so as the years went on, whereas the social and political radicals in liberated China tended to be the children of families who made up the privileged classes in pre-1949 China. It takes no great sociological insight to unravel the paradox. The one-time revolutionaries, who came mostly from the poorer peasantry and the working class, were, along with their children, favored for political positions, educational opportunities, and employment after 1949. They enjoyed an unaccustomed high social status under the new regime. The children of former capitalists, ex-landlords, and intellectuals, on the other hand, labored under various forms of social, economic, and political discrimination, and nowhere more than in the educational system. Whereas those who could claim lowly class origins, at least those among them with access to political power, had a conservative stake in the post-revolutionary order and its new inequalities, the offspring of the former ruling classes were the new underprivileged. It is hardly surprising that the latter responded so enthusiastically to radical Maoist critiques of bureaucratic privilege and calls for greater equality, while the former rallied to the defense of the party and channeled their revolutionary energies into assaults against the offspring of the formerly privileged social classes. Given this rather paradoxical outcome, it is not a surprise that Mao was so fixated on rethinking the dictatorship of the proletariat in his final years before his death. It is clear that one of the key lessons to be drawn from the Cultural Revolution is that the dictatorship of the proletariat is a concept that needs to be rethought and reformulated. I also believe that Mao Zedong was correct in identifying a bureaucratic stasis and decline in revolutionary creativity amongst the party elite. The party and the masses needed to get politicized again to not forget their original revolutionary mission to bring about the emancipation and socialist transformation of society, albeit a bit more gradually. However, unlike Mao, I do not believe that the answer to revitalizing the revolutionary transition to socialism is to simply keep intensifying class struggle, but rather to continuously facilitate the creation of new alternative socialist structures and organizations that are more desirable to capitalist ones. Class struggle and endlessly purging bureaucrats does not necessarily lead to a politics of creation. By itself, class struggle just leads to a self-destructive identity politics of negation. Of course, class struggle is absolutely necessary during the period where there's, you know, actual classes. But class struggle without a clearly defined political antidote can have a highly depoliticizing effect. When class becomes an identitarian category expanded to encompass certain attitudes, it is easy to weaponize it to mask what are really just political differences. Kind of like how Stalin used terms such as bourgeois and kulak to describe all of his enemies and frame what was really just an attempt to remove political opposition to his line as a moral anti-revisionist crusade for the proletariat. During the Cultural Revolution, Red Guards did something similar to justify their actions when battling each other for power. Egalitarian organizations cannot truly operate successfully independently from the state unless the people reject and overcome the logic of dismissal in favor of pluralization. I am of the opinion that the self-destructive tendency of dismissal can be overcome and unlearned, but gradually. In the meantime, it must be contained through democratic legal institutions. Mao really did want to give power to the people, 
we had zero plan as to how this power would be mediated. Vague ideas of radical democracy, decentralization, or simply just giving power to the people are common intuitive antidotes that you often hear in response to the problems of state authoritarianism and bureaucratic centralization in actually existing state socialist countries. However, as we have seen in the Cultural Revolution, people are capable of being just as authoritarian towards each other without the help of any state authorities. Mob justice, without any institutional framework to regulate it, is sometimes no better than state tyranny. I think that many liberal theorists and early thinkers of the Enlightenment were correct to be skeptical of the masses and how they can issue their own kind of tyranny. Except the difference is that liberal thinkers, unlike Marxists and communists, did not consider or even try to emancipate the masses from their own economic servitude. The socioeconomic conditions must be created to maximize human evolution and emancipate human potential for as many people as possible. In this regard, Marxism tries to carry the torch of the Enlightenment. Conclusions and Critical Reflections The Cultural Revolution encourages us to reflect more on the tensions and risks of an egalitarian mass movement that seeks to create power outside of the state, independently from the party. Reflecting on the experience of the Cultural Revolution and pondering solutions to the problems that it posed are quite important for so-called anti-authoritarian libertarian socialists who claim to believe in radical democracy, spontaneity, as opposed to a Leninist party seizing state power. Such reflections are equally useful for Marxist-Leninists who believe that communism can be built from above, as well as for Maoists who insist that elements of the Chinese revolutionary experience like the Cultural Revolution can simply be replicated elsewhere. The events of the Chinese Cultural Revolution simply do not leave us with a blueprint or model for revolutionary strategy. While Mao Zedong thought certainly has a lot of valuable insights, ultimately I believe the experience of the Cultural Revolution leaves us with far more questions than answers. Part of what makes the Cultural Revolution such a significant event is that it compels us to rethink what are some of the most basic premises of emancipatory politics. What is communism for? What specifically makes communism good? What exactly is the good society that we strive to create by abolishing all class distinctions? If the goal of emancipatory politics is to achieve freedom, then what are the conditions for freedom? And how can a revolutionary movement avoid bureaucratic ossification and give power to the people without it eating itself? Reinvigorating a politics of creation requires us to think the values and specific vision as to what the good society of communism ought to look like. One Dime is a fan-funded project, so if you get educational value out of my work, then your support on Patreon would mean a lot to me. Plus, by becoming a patron, you will get access to exclusive content and my private Discord server. In the latest exclusive podcast, I give a summary of the main books that I got my information from for this video, and a little guide as to how to navigate big historical topics in general. Thank you very much to the patrons who have supported me so far.